Then Secretary of State Colin Powell, about a year and a half ago, said, in just eight years since the crisis group's founding, you have become one of the world's premier non-governmental organizations, working from the Balkans to Burma, from Central Africa to Colombia, and many places in between. ICG has an expert presence and staying power in places that make headlines, as well as in places which tend to get crowded out of them. ICG tells power what it thinks and advocates both with passion and effectiveness. It is a continuous source of ideas and insights for governments, parliaments, international institutions, the media, and fellow NGOs. In short, ICG is an organization that matters. Mr. Schneider comes to this organization with an impressive background as well. From 1999 to 2001, he was the director of the Peace Corps. As he recently, when we were talk, chatting, said, the defeat of the Gore presidency meant that he had to leave a job that he loved well and had looked forward to working for into the future. I think that in some ways, though, the work that he does today for the International Crisis Group is as or perhaps more important. Prior to that, he'd been chief of the Office of Analysis and Strategic pa Planning in the Pan American Health Organization. Before that, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Mark Schneider. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, I should add that uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here at Dartmouth and to discuss the responsibility to protect, which really is preventing conflict before the outbreak of deadly violence. And it's sort of appropriate that it be at this program that John Sloan Dickey uh, is named for John Sloan Dickey. I read that he said in 1946 that the world's troubles are your troubles, and that, but there, and that there's nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. Sadly, we li live in an age today where the world truly is in trouble, and where outrageous and incredibly grisly violence fills the airwaves every evening. We see car bombs at police stations and schools in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, New York, Washington, Madrid, and now London have all been through terrorist attacks and are braced for more. And further away from the television cameras in Congo and Darfur, in northern Uganda and Colombia, in Nepal and elsewhere, political violence, much of it targeted at civilians, runs up an unacceptable toll. I applaud Dartmouth for bringing together people who are trying to change this grim spectacle and cre create opportunity where there's been so much suffering. No one would dispute the fact, and that means decision makers, policy makers, virtually in every country, that there needs to be greater international commitment to conflict prevention, mitigation, and resolution before war and disaster occurs. The reality is that in this world, no one, none of us, is immune from the threat of deadly violence, whether spurred by ethnic, racial, or religious hatred, by frustration born of historic exclusion and denial of human rights, by partisan competition for power, or by forces driven by greed to control diamonds, timber, or illegal drugs. Yet it still remains extremely difficult to get the international community to do what it should. International institutions remain weak, compromised by competing interests, and too often ineffective. Over the past 15 years, the world has repeatedly failed to respond either rapidly or vigorously to tragedies as plain as the light of day. In fact, it was the failure of our collective will to respond in Bosnia and in Rwanda that produced the organization that I work for now, the International Crisis Group. As you heard, our primary mission is to try and prevent or resolve deadly conflict across the globe. To the degree that nations would adhere to international law, respect human rights, and abide by humanitarian norms, our task would be removed. Unfortunately, that's not the case, and we're working on the ground around the globe to try and shine light onto situations that should not and must not be swept under the carpet. Several months ago, I asked former Canadian General Romeo Dallaire, who headed the, the ill-fated and under-equipped UN peacekeeping mission in Rwanda, uh, 
that was powerless as that country's genocide unfolded in 1994. If what occurred in Rwanda was a result of the failure of information or the failure of will, his answer was clear. He said that what took place in Rwanda a decade ago is happening today in Darfur. And it's not a question of the lack of information, it's a failure of will. Rwanda may have unfolded with blinding speed, 800,000 people murdered in 100 days. But that really is not an excuse because the events could be seen unfolding. The early warning signs were there. And what we've seen afterwards in Bosnia and now in Darfur is a slower rolling catastrophe. And again, absolutely inadequate international response. And that brings me to the fundamental point that the responsibility to protect, incorporating that into the way that nations and the international community views their responsibility may be one way to shift the balance against the horrors that we have seen. And the idea is quite simple. And it's a fundamental change in other ways, revolutionary in the way that nations have dealt with each other over centuries. And that is to say that simply that what goes on within a nation concerns the broader international community if certain thresholds are crossed. Sovereign leaders can no longer perpetrate atrocities or internal campaigns of repression and terror and claim that they're internal matters and that the international community has no responsibility or role to intervene. The fact that Slobodan Milosevic sits in a tribunal in The Hague that Charles Taylor may be headed in the same direction, says a lot about the world's increased unwillingness to turn a blind eye to gross human rights abuses. Almost every dictator today at least has to recognize that he faces a risk of an international indictment if their behavior crosses a certain line. No one wants to deny the legitimacy of sovereignty, but it's time to recognize the equal legitimacy of human rights and to do far better to legitimize and to implement a collective responsibility to protect when the extremes of ethnic cleansing and other massive atrocities loom before us. And they still are occurring. The Crisis Group, Human Rights Watch, and CNN and Nightline have chronicled the destruction of human, of human life in Darfur. Five United Nations Security Council resolutions have passed. There are some 34 to 3,600 African Union troops on the ground, solely with the responsibility, however, to monitor a ceasefire, not to intervene to protect civilians. Humanitarian supplies are not blocked completely by the Khartoum government. Yet two million men, women, and children remain in displaced and refugee camps. 200,000 already are dead, and more are dying and women and girls are subject to rape by the Janjaweed militias, which have yet to be disarmed and demobilized. And again, this is something that we've now been seeing for two years. Only yesterday, Jan uh, Eglund, who's the coordinator for humanitarian affairs at the UN, said that humanitarian relief flows into those camps may have to stop because of new attacks by the Janjaweed. On Wednesday, 29 more people were, were killed when the John Jaweed militias ran into a, a village uh, in, in Darfur and killed, at this point, 29. You know, uh, when President Bush was given a memo at one point early in his administration about Rwanda, he wrote, not on my watch. That is not a genocide on my watch. Well, let me tell you that Darfur is taking place on his watch. And the United States, despite being one of the more activist countries in, in speaking out, has not acted to prevent massive atrocities from occurring and that are still occurring. Over the course of the past decade, as you've heard, the International Crisis Group has been an active and hopefully constructive critic of flaws in conflict prevention and post-conflict reconstruction. And we continue to be. The key for us is, is what we do has three elements. 
First, it's on the ground analysis of the drivers of conflict. As you heard, we're in now some, we're working in some 50 countries out of 25 sites around the world. And the experts that work for us, they are, we're from 36 different nationalities, 50 different languages, they know the countries, and they attempt to talk to everyone in those countries. One of the benefits of being in a non-governmental organization is we don't have any restrictions. And to some degree, we have the ability to move where members of, of embassies cannot. So we speak to militias, we speak to the police, we speak to the victims. And based on that analysis, the second part of what we do is to try and define policy options for the countries and for the international community to help prevent those drivers of conflict from turning into deadly violence or taking action to halt them. And the third part of what we do is advocacy. When the organization was created, it was created, created with the idea that not only the staff, but the board of directors would actively engage in bringing these recommendations to the desks of decision makers. The idea being that after the Cold War, what happened in certain out of the way places did not concern decision makers in the major powers in the same way that they did when there was a link back as a result of the Cold War for strategic purposes. And so the board consists of a half a dozen former heads of state, about two dozen former ministers from around the world. And essentially, they and we, I run the Washington office, we have an office in New York and one in London, and we attempt to meet with decision makers, and you heard Secretary Powell's comment, we attempt to get those reports, and some of them I think are in the back of the room, to the desks of decision makers, and sometimes through the media to the desks of decision makers. And in looking at what had failed to happen in post-conflict situations and areas where we felt that the international community had failed to act, the president of the organization is Gareth Evans, former foreign minister of Australia. He came up with the idea that rather than talk about intervening, let's talk about there being a responsibility on the part of the international community to protect. And that at some point, that responsibility to protect has to be defined as a responsibility to prevent, a responsibility then to react when it's clear that individual nations are failing their responsibilities to their citizens. And finally, in the case where there is a conflict resolved, the responsibility to rebuild. Kofi Annan argued that the world must advance the causes of security, development, and human rights together. Otherwise, none will succeed. Now, conflict prevention has to be thought of in a certain way. It involves, first, early warning and effective analysis. Second, it involves the availability of appropriate instruments, diplomacy, humanitarian response, economic support, political engagement, preventive deployment of forces, and the threat of force. And as a last resort, within a framework of international legal authority, the use of military force. And finally, conflict prevention requires the political will to use the right instrument when it is needed. Now, early warning means looking at the structural causes of conflict. What has been driving the forces that are beginning to appear to produce the kind of conflict that will result in deadly violence? Whether it's religious discrimination, ethnic violence, socioeconomic inequity, failure of post-conflict reconstruction to address the causes of the original conflict. It's vital to have people on the ground identifying those and providing an early warning. But those structural causes, in a sense, set the, the environment for conflict, the tinder, and then a spark flashes. And that spark can be a variety of things. Frequently, as you've seen recently, it's been flawed elections illegitimate elections that finally push the situation over the edge. In others, sudden drops in economic well-being, mass movements of population, at times the fragmentation of ruling elites, 
And in Darfur, Rwanda, and Bosnia, it essentially was a decision by national power elites to exploit ethnic divisions, to eliminate legitimate political competitions at national or local levels, to extend their own hold on, on power. Now, as I said, the second element in conflict prevention is having a peace-building toolkit to contain those forces, the drivers of conflict, whether it's building up physical infrastructure and human capital, encouraging the inclusion of the indigenous and minority groups, strengthening civil society. The fact is, for example, that we've had to recre recreate an international police presence for every new peacekeeping mission around the globe over the course of the past 10 years. It shows how much we still have to learn. To deal with the sparks, there's a need for more diplomatic CPR, getting nations and multilateral organizations, including the UN, to do more of these things better fact-finding, mediation, alternative dispute resolution, preventive diplomacy. And here they need to figure out how to use non-governmental organizations better. The track to diplomacy that is now available to the formal governmental agencies from the non-governmental world is, has been used now in Aceh to resolve a conflict ahead of time. It's being called on today in Ethiopia Yet despite all that we know, Secretary General Kofi Annan could restate today what he said in 2000. And I quote, he said, conflict prevention lies at the heart of the mandate of the United Nations, but it is still lacking. And five years later, the culture of reaction rather than prevention still exists. The United Nations has no comprehensive formal mechanism to bring together information from all sources to identify approaching crises. In fact, the Department of Peacekeeping at the UN is forbidden to do any planning for potential operations that have not yet been sanctioned, which makes effective contingency planning virtually impossible. But the UN isn't alone. If I had to ask you how long into the future does the CIA's, the National Intelligence Council of the CIA operate to establish what they call a watch list? Give me a guess of how long that they look into the future to try to identify countries at risk where there might be conflict in which U.S. forces might be effective. Try six months. The watch list is prepared and it's a six-month six watch list. That simply is not long enough. That's not the kind of time frame to be able then to intervene effectively to deal with the structural causes of conflict. However, this is changing. The United Kingdom, particularly out of, out of um, uh, Tony Blair's office, the US and the EU are beginning to look seriously at the problem down the road of what they call fragile states and when fragile states are beginning to fail. And what are the factors that are likely to stoke conflict? The US, in fact, has created a new body within the State Department called the Coordination of Reconstruction and Stabilization. And that has the specific mandate from the Secretary to, it, to develop and establish an early warning capacity. I was briefed two days ago by a Department of Defense planner in the Secretary of Defense's office who said that we are now building an early warning capacity within the Department of Defense. Two things struck me. First, that they're doing it only now. And second, that they began the month after the State Department approved their early warning capacity planning program. And you have to think that those two are linked. But in any case, it's still an open question whether they're going to be given the kind of resources and authority to operate over time and be given real power within the bureaucracy. They both say that they're going to make this a unified U.S early warning capacity. I hope so. That's clearly been woefully lacking. And they also say that they recognize that it, in order to be effective, that it has to engage with the broader international community. Again, that also has been lacking. However, there is some, there's some good news. In the Millennium Plus Five Summit that was just concluded in, in, in New York, uh, 
there was an agreement to create something called peace building commissions, which will bring together on a country by country basis when there's a decision to do that, all of the agencies in the UN, the World Bank, other international financial institutions and regional organizations um, and the countries that are providing most of the uh, troops for peacekeeping efforts in that, in that country. It's a good step. The problem is it's only going to be concerned with post-conflict situations, not with prevention. However, post-conflict failures have been one of the major causes of future conflict. The World Bank did a study looking at the past 50 years of international and internal violence. And they found out that this factor, the single most common, the best predictor of future conflict was that a country had experienced a previous conflict. And the UN, looking at 60 peacekeeping efforts, found that in the first five years, there had been a return to conflict because the post-conflict reconstruction process had failed in one or more ways to deal with the, the original causes of the conflict or had been fatally flawed in a certain way by withdrawing too early or by not providing sufficient resources. And let me just give you some of the lessons there. One is that the post-conflict planning has to have buy-in from the local community. There, and not just from the local government or the two, the two parties that were at war that have come together and made a peace accord. It has to include civil society. It has to include women's organizations. It has to include, include people on the ground. They have to buy into that post-conflict reconstruction plan. The second is that you have to deal with the problem of law enforcement from the beginning. And the international community has to have at its disposal that capability. And the third is that you can't do it in six months and then have the international commitment end. And let me just give you one example for the planning. In about 19, well, January 1962, in El Salvador, they signed a peace accord at a place called the Chapultepec Palace in Mexico City. The guerrillas in El Salvador, the FMLN, and the government of El Salvador. About two weeks after that, I was part of a UN mission that was attempting to help the parties define what the post-conflict reconstruction process would be, how it would work, how they would, in a sense, implement the peace agreement most effectively. And I was at a reception at the home of the uh, UNDP res resident representative, and one of the guerrilla com commanders came up to me, not with a rifle, but, and said, uh, we'll have all of our forces in the demobilization camps, in the zones, in 10 days. She said, by the way, who's going to feed us? No one had planned for transforming a guerrilla army that had operated in, in the hills into a demobilization zone in a controlled space where somebody else had to provide food, medical care. And so the UN scurried around to try and remedy that. But that's the kind of failure in post-conflict planning that has occurred in the past. And the second in Haiti. I was in Haiti at the beginning of this year. And I met with the head of civil, international civilian police, which was part of the UN peacekeeping operation. And I said, I'm told that part of the Haitian national police, the locals, that it, they include criminals. They include, include, include people who are carrying out attacks for political purposes on the opposition. And he said, I know. We don't have sufficient forces to stop them. The failure to have its standing international police presence in those post-conflict situations while you start to build a new, impartial, independent, non-politicized police force has been a fundamental failure of post-conflict situations. By the way, it still hasn't changed. The Haitian National Police continues to have within it individuals that the international community views as criminals. In fact, they gave the names of 38 people that they believe are part of a death squad that killed political opponents, and those people have yet to be removed from the police force. Now, again, there is some good news. 
The Millennium Plus Five Summit, they did agree to create within the Office of the Secretary General a rule of law assistance unit, and they agreed that there should be a standing international police capacity. No one committed detectives and no one committed dollars, but hopefully for the first time, both the General Assembly and the Security Council has uh, endorsed the idea and hopefully it will be implemented. As I mentioned, El Salvador taught us some lessons, not all of which have been learned, either in Afghanistan, in Iraq, or in Haiti. Short-term planning that relies on military victory rapid transitions that exclude civil society and the full participation of women, transitions punctuated by early elections, hastily organized, and a fast exit by peacekeeping forces and by international donors, sets in motion a pendulum that ultimately produces renewed deadly conflict. Now let me go back to conflict prevention and Romulo Dallaire's focus on political will. Most discussions of political will spend time lamenting its absence rather than organizing its presence. It doesn't just happen. It's not just cooking oil that you put into a stew. You need to use intelligence, intelligently a whole range of ingredients. One is institutional. There needs to be a focus within the bureaucracy that has the responsibility, and to some degree, the bureaucratic responsibility to be responsible for conflict prevention, and then to propose actions up the policy line. And one would hope, again, that there's a new, this new peace building support office in the office of the Secretary General will take that, that role and responsibility. But you have to organize beyond the institutional locus, you have to have certain arguments. First, you have to have comparative cost arguments. Why acting, why intervening to deal with prevention early is far less costly than dealing with the consequences of failing to act. National interest arguments, understanding and addressing legitimate national interests, including being seen as a responsible international actor. Moral and legal arguments of responsibility, whether obligations under the UN Charter or under national law. And finally, domestic or institutional political arguments. Why failing to act will bring you misery at the polls. And all of these arguments need to be used. When you're pressing a decision maker in any of the governments around the world, you have to use all these arguments in order to try and construct sufficient political will to have them act. And that bring me, brings me back to the responsibility to protect. The Millennium Plus Five Summit said there is a responsibility to protect. Begins with the state, begins with prevention, but there is a separate international responsibility to prevent civilian populations from being subject to atrocities, to ethnic cleansing, or to genocide when states fail to act or are themselves complicit. And that is the case in Darfur today. The next cable from the field, from the next Romeo Dallaire, warning of the next wave of mass violence, must not be answered with silence. And part of the responsibility for engendering that political will in the US government and in the UN Security Council resides with all of us. We all are members of organizations. We all are citizens of our countries. Some of us are taxpayers. And we all are opinion makers. And when one sees the challenges to making the responsibility to protect a reality, I grant you that it seems difficult to succeed. But many countries and many peoples have passed through their own nights of darkness and awakened to a new dawn. I'll only repeat the words of Pablo Neruda when he received the Nobel Peace Prize. He was from Chile, from a country which had passed through 17 years of dictatorship and darkness. And he said, only with fiery patience will we conquer the splendid city that will shed light, justice, and dignity on all men. It's our task, yours and mine, to exhibit that fiery patience and pursue the changes that will advance the responsibility to protect, and in so doing, promote peace, justice, and security. Thank you. I'm open to questions. <laughs>
Sir. large NGO, I'd be interested in knowing how you're funded. Do you, would you like to make a contribution? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I take checks. Um, we were funded, we initially were funded um, by uh, two foundations. One, the Open Society Institute of George Soros, and by the Rockefeller uh, Foundation. Uh, we currently are funded by, I believe it's 14 different foundations uh, and by 17 different governments. The, it's about half and half, but it's about 45-45 with the other 10% from individual donations. The largest governmental donor is the British um, uh, International Development uh, Agency, the equivalent of USAID. Uh, the second largest is the Swiss. Um, the third are the Scandinavian countries. Uh, the fourth is USAID, um, and the other ten are smaller. Um, the foundations, the largest is uh, George Soros' Open Society Institute. Uh, we have, um, I think it just, every foundation you can think of. Uh, Packard, uh, MacArthur, Rockefeller, Ford, um, Pew, it goes on. dependence on some funders might compromise your independence in some of the work you're doing? No. Nope. <laughs> One is because we don't, we don't take fund, we don't have a, a, a bulk of our funding coming from any single donor. And two, because the, the funds, the bulk of our funds are core funding, so that it's not to do a, re a specific report. And uh, three, because we, we, we would not take the money. You mentioned that some places where peacekeeping operations have happened have gone back into conflict five years later, um, but obviously there have been some that have been successful and peace has been maintained. Right. Similarly, sometimes when you don't have any peacekeeping uh, intervention, you know, the war ends and the country sorts itself out, and sometimes it might delve in back into conflict by itself too. Uh, what is the um, the peace in the, the future peace rate, I guess? of countries where intervention has happened compared to countries where no intervention was taking place? I'd say most of the time where you've had an international, in the last 15 or 20 years where you've had international conflicts that have ended with a peace agreement, there, the United Nations usually has been a party. Um, in the case where you've had internal conflicts, um, prior to 19, um, I'd say prior to 1995, uh, there was more of a balance, but subsequently, the, again, the international community has been engaged in most of them. Could you tell us what you mean by international community, and then maybe describe the relationship between your organization and the United Nations? Right. Um, the way I've generally been talking about it as the, the range of both governmental and non-governmental organizations that are concerned with international relations and the relations between countries and the relations um, of, uh, in this case, individuals within countries who we believe have the certain inter internationally protected uh, human rights. So it in includes the United Nations, the regional organizations such as the African Union, the European Union, the international financial institutions, international non-governmental organizations that range from, on the human rights side, from Human Rights Watch to um, Amnesty, uh, and the humanitarian organizations that are engaged in international uh, work as well. And your relationship, your organization's relationship to the We basically operate independently so far as our analysis, although we we deal with all of those since they're all actors in terms of, of attempting to acquire information. And then uh, when we reach our recommendations as to the policy actions that we think should be taken, we attempt to engage all of them either directly because they're the decision makers or indirectly because we think that, that they can, in a sense, echo our um, arguments uh, with those decision makers. And I'll give you a couple of examples. 
Um, today, today, um, the a, a group of organizations uh, was concerned about in Uzbekistan the after a massacre that occurred in, in Andijan, about 450 refugees fled across the border into Kyrgyzstan. There was a serious threat that the Uzbek forces would go across the border and actually physically bring them back or pressure Kyrgyzstan to, um, to send them back. Um, a group of organizations, based on the information that we had on the field, we organized a, a, a task force in Washington of a range of organizations working in Central Asia and we came together with a recommendations to the State Department and to the Congress to try and encourage Kyrgyzstan not to do that and to cooperate with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to provide safe haven. That's one thing that we did and that we do together. Um, the, um, um, the reason I was thinking about Uzbekistan is it's expected that next w this next week the European uh, Union is likely to uh, come out with a series of, of steps, including sanctions against the government of Uzbekistan, until they permit an international investigation of the events in Andijan that we have been pressing for. And so there is an instance where we have pressed, we have, we have urged the European Union to act, and it appears that they're likely to do that. In Ireland, in Holy War? In Ireland, yes. we're, we're not. Um, as, as you heard, we're active in about, uh, right now, 50 between 45 and 50 countries. Um, and Ireland is not one of them. And the, there are two reasons. One is because um, we generally have been active in countries where we feel there's not a lot of attention being given. Um, and where we think we can have greater impact. Um, it's, a qu if it's a question of resources. We're not in every area where there is conflict and where we might otherwise be engaged. And the board basically makes the decision of where we're going to, to expand based on resources and the question of whether we can have an impact, whether there are other entities, and obviously in Northern Ireland, in Ireland there's a substantial amount of activity already underway. About the instruments you need to protect to, to protect to prevent conflict and react to it. You mentioned that um, there's a constant to, to recreate the peacekeeping forces that we send in countries. Would you advocate for the creation of a permanent peacekeeping force under the UN? And if so, what would it take to, to create that? It's interesting because that's what I was saying is that for the first time, the UN endorsed in the declaration for the Millennium Plus Five Summit a standing capacity for post-conflict situations for international civilian police. And hopefully it will include um, elements of the, more broadly the rule of law so that when you go into a Kosovo or a Haiti and there is a there is an absence of uh, independent police, judiciary, and jails, that in that situation, the international peacekeeping force will be able to respond for a sufficient amount of time so that you're then able to build up, have the local government and country build its own independent, competent, non-politicized police and judiciary. And yes, that, I think that that is necessary. And fortunately, I think we're, I think we're on the way to creating that. I wonder to what extent you believe in poverty and, and economics lies at the root of a lot of these <coughs> issues of fragile states and eventually failed states. And I'm thinking particularly of some of Fareed Zakaria's work where he creates thresholds of per capita income as predictors for moving towards democracy and Jeffrey Sachs' work and the poverty. But is the nub of this really economics at some point? And, and to what extent do you agree or disagree with that? And does your organization work actively on sustainable development sorts of issues? Um, let me take the last part first. We don't, we don't work in the area of sustainable development as such. What we do is we try and identify in given countries the what are the factors driving conflict. And what we have found frequently is that it, 
country with situations of increased, particularly changes, changes within the economic situation that result in substantial reduction in well-being for population groups, uh, and particularly when there's a substantial amount of extreme poverty already, or when, when particular population groups are driven into poverty as a result of government decisions, that the situation becomes more, conflict becomes more likely. Um, there's no question that if you take a look at the range of countries and where internal conflict has occurred, that it's more frequent in countries that are, that are less developed and where those populations have felt excluded. Um, nevertheless, poverty as such is not directly linked to, in other words, that has not demonstrated itself as a single factor to indicate the likelihood of conflict. Usually it's the changes in economic conditions, but usually within groups that are already at a relatively low level of development. And, and by the way, one of the things we do say is in terms usually of dealing with the problems of the structural problems uh, um, underlying conflict is that you need to have a, a sustainable development um, that deals with those problems, <coughs> provides for inclusion of all sectors of the population that begins to provide for economic development. Sir? You used the word sanctions. Can sanctions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You used the word sanctions yeah. uh, a few minutes ago. Can sanctions often be counterproductive? I think that it, any particular tool of policy can be counterproductive. The issue becomes how you analyze it, whether it's, I'll give you a particular example right now. Um, we're, we're looking, we're hopeful that um, in the case of, Car of Sudan, that, uh, that countries will adopt targeted sanctions against the leadership um, in, with respect to visas and their external assets. And the same with respect to the Karimov government in Uzbekistan. And there's a distinction between sanctions which result in a direct impact on the population, let's say halting the purchase of a country's exports um, and these kinds of targeted sanctions. The other is that frequently if the sanctions are, are unilaterally carried out by a single country, they're rarely effective. On the other hand, when they're broadly uh, adopted and implemented, let's say in the case of apartheid in South Africa, um, they probably do have a greater uh, possibility of being successful. Um, there, as you know, there have been a significant number of studies about sanctions and about uh, which ones and when. Um, but I think there's a tendency now on the part of most observers to focus on targeted sanctions of the leadership of the organizations that provide the leadership with revenues and of the, um, their assets when those assets are overseas. Someone in this room might be interested in, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not you have internships in your group and what their nature is. Sure. Um, we have, unfortunately, unpaid internships <laughs> uh, in the organization, both during the, the uh, school year and uh, during uh, the summer. Um, and uh, on our website, by the way, all of our reports are on our website. Uh, our website is www.crisisgroup.org, and that has all of, our, all of our reports and all of the opportunities for internships as well. And then um, if you're looking particularly for Washington, obviously you can send me an email. author asserts that one in every 25 people is a sociopath, someone who has absolutely no remorse. And I, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about these people that you encounter when you're trying to make these persuasive arguments. <laughs> now, now, remember, generally I'm dealing with the U.S. government, so I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment. <laughs> um, but in, in some of the discussions that... Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a, an example. Even somebody, um, I mean, somebody like Pinochet in Chile, uh, in many ways I would consider him to be a sociopath. Uh, on the other hand, I think that he also responds to uh, certain kinds of pressure and it took a long time to find the way to organize sufficient pressure to alter his conduct. 
Um, I think there, there needs, you need to look, Charles Taylor. Um, Charles Taylor finally agreed when he was faced with being uh, sent to Sierra Leone in the in International Criminal Court there, Special Tribunal, uh, to leave Liberia and to accept uh, Obasanjo's offer of, of temporary asylum in, uh, in Nigeria. And now that was a case where uh, even a sociopath uh, was able to recognize when the forces arrayed against him were such that uh, his options for survival were limited. And I suppose that whether it's political, legal, or military, uh, you have to create a situation in which those individuals feel they don't have any other option. Sir. Mark, you said before that you were somewhat optimistic about the ultimate creation of an international peacekeeping force. I wanted to press you further on that. And I ask you, in light of what happened you know, in New York, uh, what wasn't done you know, at that summit, um, you know, the basis for your optimism is I'd like to you know, get a sense of who's going to take the leadership, who's going to pay, uh, and how are the relevant UN you know, documents are going to be um, the key. Do you want the whole story? <laughs> I mean, I think that that well, I think that the the role played by the U.S. delegation after Ambassador Bolton uh, took over um, was destructive in with respect to certain elements in the Millennium Plus Five Declaration, particularly those dealing with disarmament. Uh, non-proliferation. Um, I think that that it almost was destructive with respect to responsibility to protect. There is a there. You have to understand that that there were a uh, variety of versions of the final declaration that were uh, being discussed from the spring on. And on August 5th, there was a document that had certain parentheses around certain language, and other languages accepted. The the U.S. had been part of the negotiation. It came in after he came, it sort of went back and proposed, put back on the table a lot of what it originally had been, had, it had proposed, but agreed to uh, give up. And it almost cost the entire responsibility to protect section because it, it, with, it removed the elements on prevention, it removed the, um, the element on a responsibility on the part of the international community tax. It focused on the national responsibility. Um, in the end, the U.S. accepted what became a fairly strong statement on responsibility to protect. It includes prevention. It includes, in fact, the U.S. originally said only a moral responsibility. In the end, they agreed to take out the moral, so it's, it is a responsibility, which per permits you to argue there are some legal elements there, that when, that when a state fails, the international community has a responsibility in the face of genocide or atrocities to act. Um, on the question of the Peace Building Commission, however, the U.S. actually had supported that from the beginning. And I think the U.S. is one of the reasons why it stayed in. The, because there were, there were countries in that, in the, particularly some of the countries in the developing world, that did not want to see this kind of entity with the power to um, monitor closely a post-conflict situation created. And this is the first time that, the, that this entity includes the, all of the international financial institutions and the regional organizations as a standing body to monitor post-conflict reconstruction planning. Now, we argued that it should be working out of the Security Council and have, in a sense, the power of the Security Council behind it. Um, there, again, there was opposition from many in the developing world who felt that the General Assembly needed to be uh, as engaged. And so in the, the organization that decides when you're going to have a peacekeeping commi commission formed for a particular country will include both Security Council and General Assembly. Um, I, think, I do think this is going to, to take place. They also authorize a standing fund for this peace, this peace building commission to be able to act immediately Assume that there's a post-conflict situation. There's an agreement that the Peace Building Commission is putting forward a plan. In the past, the Secretary General and the Security Council would put out an appeal for funding. 
and it takes months for that to happen. Secretary General requested a peace building fund of $250 million. Unfortunately, they, they didn't agree to the $250 million, but they did agree to the fund. And I think that there will be significant contributions between now and December that will permit it to get started. That's why I was optimistic. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about how you gather this information and the sense of or the level of danger you get when you gather this information, like the hard evidence that you find. The people who work for us in the field, in the countries, that day in, day out acquire this information and ultimately translate it into the reports that we produce, they are enormously courageous. I unfortunately don't have to do that. Uh, but they are truly courageous, and they're committed. Uh, we've lost one um, staffer um, in Somalia. Um, we're, we're, I can only tell you that they are committed to trying to make a difference and to have an impact, and they do uh, a tremendous job. Um, the reason the secretary and others, yesterday the um, chairman, the, the ranking member of the Senate, of the Senate Armed Services Committee, um, made a similar statement about our report that just came out on Iraq and um, what we thought needed to be done with respect to the current constitution that's coming up for a vote on October 15th. And he used it as the prelude to questioning Secretary Rumsfeld. And again, um, the people that are doing the research um, are, are courageous and, the, and they make their best judgments. I mean, they're not uh, foolhardy. They make their best judgments about where they can go, when they can go, and um, act accordingly. Gentleman in the back. Uh, well, first of all, as a former coordinator uh, uh, of Warren B. Studies, I want to mention that the Dickey Center provides some support to students who take unpaid uh, internships, <laughs> if there right. are any in the room who are interested. Uh, secondly, I want to, I think you never answered the student's question over here clearly, and I wanted to uh, come back to sure. it. He asked, uh, whether or not you have uh, data that shows a conflict is less likely to re-erupt uh, if there has been an intervention than if it just left alone. Uh, and lastly, my question would be, in, in conflict situations, which I assume this is true, that your group intervenes when the United States is involved, are there a different set of sort of ground rules you use in terms of how you approach the United States as compared to some smaller nations? Uh, on the latter, no. I mean, you basically, we look at who's involved in the conflict and those countries that, that uh, either uh, have been or can play a role in bringing the conflict to an end, uh, those are the nations that we direct the policy recommendations to. Um, there have been frequently reports where the U U.S. isn't directly or has not played a major role, um, where the reports are, are focused on European Union or on, um, um, on France, more on, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire um, than um, and the U.N. than the U.S. Um, so no, I don't. There is not a difference there. We're still looking for who has the resources, the capability to affect conditions in a particular moment in time. With, in terms of, of the, um, going back to your question, in that sense, no, I don't have data that says that there's more, that there's greater likelihood or less likelihood for a recurrence of conflict in situations where there's been conflict and there's been either no international involvement or international involvement. Um, one of the things that I think I would say that, that it's rare to see those conflicts end without some international involvement. Um, when you're getting involved in a conflict and you're approaching like the different parties involved, do you find them usually cooperative with your group, seeing as it's non-governmental? Or do you find yourselves usually having to persuade them to allow you to get involved? Um, if it's, it's an interesting question. Um, most of the time, people want to make their case. And so they're, they're not um, unwilling to engage and discuss issues with us. 
And even when they assume, having seen our previous reports, that we may not be disposed to their point of view. I'll give you a, a, a good example. We've had a, an excellent um, project director in Belgrade for the last seven years uh, named James Lyon. And our reports are almost universally critical of the Serbian government's failure to cooperate with the, um, the International Tribunal in The Hague in terms of bringing war criminals uh, to justice, as well as um, critical of Serbia's supporting parallel structures in, um, in Kosovo that have extended the likelihood of ethnic conflict there, um, and similarly in Bosnia. And yet he has access to virtually everybody. And I mean, they're, they may, and they don't agree with much of what he does, but thus far, um, we haven't had that problem. CIA six-month watch list. Um, I was just wondering if you would be willing to share your watch list, um, whether from six months to ten years. Who, who ought we be paying attention to who are currently not? Yeah, it, it's more that uh, once we decide that a given country or area um, is likely to um, have future conflict or where there has been conflict and we think we can play a role, that we then commit a substantial amount of time. So it's not a question of picking out of the air um, areas. We've made it a, a, as good a choice as we can. But to give you an idea right now, um, and then I'll have one other thing to say about that. Right now, we, we have offices, let's say, in, in Pristina and Belgrade that look at the Balkans as a whole. Um, we're in Bishkek, and we look at Central Asia as a whole. Um, we're in Jordan, and we look at the Middle East. We're in Jordan and Cairo. And those are where our offices are. We have individuals who are in Syria, uh, Israel, and, um, and Iraq, um, but we don't have offices there. Um, we have a, a sub-regional office in Nairobi that focuses on the Great Lakes area, and, um, and we've had individuals in, in Sudan and in, um, and in Somalia, um, so it, along those lines. Um, now, what we do do is we, we produce, uh, over the last year, we've produced something called Crisis Watch once a month. And that comes closest to our sense of future conflicts. And what we do there is we ask our regional experts to look beyond the countries where they're working and to look more broadly into the region as a whole and give their assessment whether things are moving in one direction or another. And that we produce on a monthly basis. Sir. Following on that, you, your opening remarks were something like the world's quite in quite a mess. Um, and uh, is that the case? I mean, we also hear that there are record setting number of democracies in the world. Um, is the world in quite a mess? And what will the future bring us? I didn't catch the last part of the question. My hearing not your speaking. Oh, I bet not. <laughs> um, we hear on the one hand that the, there's a record-setting number of democracies in the world. We hear on the other hand, in your opening remarks, you saying that the world is in quite a mess. Which is right? Both. Uh, both. Yeah. And, what, and what does the future bring? A lot of Probably. democracies are very fragile. Over the course of the past two decades, you've had a move to uh, the 34 countries in the hemisphere. Um, virtually all are formally democracies. But at the same time in the region, we've been unable to, to create policies that that's ensured the consolidation of those democracies. And you, and you have in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Nicaragua, you have situations which those, and in Peru, those democracies are under substantial challenge and uh, internally. And in that sense, the, the, while you have a growing number of democracies, the consolidation has yet to take place. On the other hand, you have the kinds of threats from non-formal government, the terrorist organizations, that we haven't had in the past. 
and you have a series of, um, of threats from against their own citizens from some governments, uh, like in Sudan, that produce the kind, and now still in, um, in, in Uzbekistan, that produce the kinds of threats to civilian populations that result in the kind of troubles that I talked about at the outset. I will say that if you look at the question of international conflict from 1993 till now, the, 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 there actually has been a reduction in the, this, the last, if you, let's say 1995 to 1996 versus 1985 95, there's actually been a reduction in the numbers of people killed and in the numbers of conflicts. One country that you didn't mention that I wanted to ask about is Colombia, mm -hmm. which of course has, a, has an awful conflict that's been going on for a long time. Are you in, is your organization involved in Colombia? And if so, could you tell us a little bit about what you have done? Sure. Um, we have been, actually, when I started uh, with this organization in 2001, we opened the first office in Colombia. And uh, we had not been involved in the region as a whole um, prior to that. Again, resources and more than anything else. Um, in Colombia, we focused on, I'd say, three issues. One is the counter-drug policy and how it relates to the conflict. The second is the issue of the, um, how the, the government of Colombia, is, uh, its links to the paramilitary and the way that has um, extended the conflict and how U.S. policy has affected both. Um, that we continue to be concerned about the failure of the government in Colombia to deal with the paramilitary effectively. And we also have been quite critical of the lack of a, of a policy dealing with the structural causes of the conflict. The absence of a rural development policy mm -hmm. that deals with the sector of the country which is the locus for violence, drugs, and um, insurgency, which is rural Colombia, and the lack of an economic development policy that deals with, uh, with those areas, which also happens to be the areas where the indigenous population resides and who have been excluded from participation uh, in the economic and political life of the country. So, I'd like to take a moment to thank you very much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, those of you that are joining us for dinner afterwards will be meeting at 6.15 in the Hanover Earth for dinner. And perhaps we can just uh, thank Mr. Schneider.